All right, we are recording. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the BMC Teaching Kitchen. My name is Paige Kerstetter, and I am a registered dietitian and culinary educator here at Boston Medical Center. And today's class is brought to you by WellSense Health Plan. We are here to cook together and learn to cook and expand our recipe library because cooking allows us to control ingredients that go into a dish, therefore allowing us to have more flexibility and choice in the nutrition content. It's also less expensive to cook than to buy pre-made food or order takeout. Um, and as well as cooking can just give us confidence. So there are all these reasons why we should learn how to cook and have those skills. In today's class, we will be making lemon pepper salmon with a summer squash quinoa salad. A very simple basic recipe with just a few ingredients. Takes about 20, 30 minutes tops if you are making it on your own outside of a food demo. So we will go ahead and get into it. As always, if you have any questions or you know you want to make a comment, feel free to unmute yourself. If you'd like to wait until after class when the recording is off, you are welcome to do that as well. So it's a little embarrassing, but I don't have the um, email confirmation with the recipe. So is there a place that um, I can go to on the Zoom to get the recipe? Yes, and that's a great question. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in the chat. I usually always try to keep it in the chat, but sometimes we have some folks chatting back and forth, so it gets lost. So I just dropped it in the chat, and okay. I, my friend Deborah put it in there as well. Not a silly question. It can sometimes get lost. Okay. Perfect. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start today's class off with doing a quick little chopping demo. Like I said, this recipe is pretty simple and easy. Um, what the, the longest part is the cooking time. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of just roll through this first prep so that way we can get our fish in the oven. Um, I already have our quinoa cooking on the stove. I just did two cups of water to one part quinoa. We're going to talk about tofu or I'm so sorry. I saw tofu in the chat. We're going to talk about... Um, grain cookery and talking more about like different types of grains and how your cooking method could maybe adjust the flavor and the texture in a little bit. But let's go ahead and get chopping. We're going to chop the other half of our zucchini. I have a yellow zucchini and then I have my green zucchini. I went ahead and I chopped these into cubes, the other half. So we'll go ahead and roll through this. And after we get these all chopped up, we are going to do um, some more knife safety and more knife demo uh, with our other zucchini. But for the sake of this recipe taking a little bit longer to cook, I just wanted to roll through this prep with you and we'll talk more about knife safety after we get this in the oven with our other zucchini. So I'm going to go ahead and chop this guy up. I'm gonna put it on my baking sheet I have here with some parchment. You are welcome to do parchment or aluminum, or if you have a good nonstick spray just right on the pan, you're welcome to do that. I always err on the side of parchment paper um, because I like a quick and easy cleanup. It depends you know, how much effort you wanna put forth when you do your cleanup, but I like to just keep it quick and easy. So we have our zucchini all chopped. Let's prep our fresh herbs. So we are using some fresh dill for today's recipe. Um, I have a big bunch of dill here. I am not going to use all this dill, but that's quite all right. I'm gonna set my salmon to the side. I'm going to pop it in the fridge and I'm actually going to probably try to make some refrigerated pickles. Nothing too crazy, doesn't take any special equipment. Um, you can find a simple recipe online. Or you could make a lovely dip and add this wonderful fresh dill. I'm just giving it a rough chop here. I like to go through with my guiding hand to really hold down those big bunches. And then I'm gonna go in and kind of just give it a nicer chop. This is definitely way more than I need for my one piece of salmon. But right now I'm just cooking one piece of salmon. You could cook two, three, or four enough for each member of the family. That's the best part about a recipe like this is it's very adaptable to the yield. Cooking in general is rather adaptable to the yield. Baking, not so much. 
Just gonna check the chat here, make sure there's no questions. Oh, a dill pickle dip. That would be really good. I think with all this extra dill, I should definitely investigate more dips. All right, we have our dill all minced up. I have a lemon here. I'm just gonna roll my lemon to activate the juices. I'm kind of just massaging it so that way when I squeeze the lemon, it's not so stuck in the rind. Put it in half. So I do have seeds here. That's quite all right. I am going to go ahead and prepare my fish. I have a glove here just to make my life easier so that way I can grab my salmon with my hand. So we'll move over here to our baking sheet. I'll move this over. We're gonna go ahead and add our fish skin side down. Oh goodness, we're losing that. All right, we are going to go ahead and do I like to measure with my eyeballs when I cook certain things because I like less dishes, but if you are someone who needs to actually get out one tablespoon, you're welcome to. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and juice my lemon over my salmon. So it says for about one tablespoon of lemon juice on top of the filet, that's over a couple filets. I really like lemon. So again, I'm just gonna kind of measure with my eyeballs. Get this far. A quick tip to juice a lemon to help you get the juice that's really stuck up in here that maybe our grip strength can't release is to put a fork in it and not puncture it the whole way through, but up in the top. And as you squeeze on the lemon, twist the fork. It will help release the juices. Perfect. I got a good amount of juice to come out there. Next step here is I'm gonna add some salt. Paige, is it easier to juice a lemon if it's room temperature versus refrigerated or does it not matter? I don't think it matters too terribly much, but I think it also just depends on how thick the rind is. I've done it either way. I do think it probably helps a little bit, but I've also just noticed too, if it's a really thick lemon, it doesn't matter how, okay. how warm it is. I do think the fork in the lemon really truly helps because I've tried, I think I have a strong grip and I usually don't get to squeeze the full lemon. So I, I heard, I don't know if this is true, that sometimes popping it into a microwave helps juice it. Interesting. Yeah, I'd be willing to try it. Probably softens out that outer layer for sure. I am putting a lot of dill on my salmon, but I will tell you, I really like dill. So I'm going to heavily season this. You can just do a sprinkle. I want my salmon covered in dill because I just prefer it that way. I have all these herbs, I wanna use them, right? And I'm gonna give it a nice generous coating of some fresh cracked black pepper. I would say dill and cracked pepper are my favorite seasoning. So this dish is amazing. I'm gonna give it just another last squeeze. I'm all about the flavors here. We lost the seed. Perfect. I'm gonna add a drizzle of oil over my salmon and over my zucchini. I'm gonna kind of just shake my pan around a little bit. I'm gonna give it a quick toss with some black pepper, a little bit of salt. Mm -hmm. And I have my oven preheated at 400 degrees. Give this a little nice toss. Word of advice, when you are roasting any veggies, especially a very water dense veggie like zucchini, you wanna have your um, pan, like within your pan, you want to have your pieces of zucchini or whatever it is spaced off enough, enough that when they start to cook, the steam can escape and they don't re-steam each other because we don't want them to be watery. We want them to kind of, you know, be a little crisp and get that nice complex flavor that you get when things are browning. So you want some space between them. So that way that steam can release. All right. I'm going to go ahead and pop this in the oven. Move back over here. Okay. Let's clean our workstation. We'll move our dill out of the way. All right. Quick rinse to the cutting board. And we are ready to rock and roll. 
All right, so we have our fish in the oven. We have our zucchini roasting with our fish, and we also have our quinoa cooking on the stove top. I started my quinoa just before class, and just to kind of go back to the quinoa or grain cookery, I started out by rinsing my grains. It's really important to rinse your grains because it helps remove dust and in some cases a bitter coating in the key, like in quinoa. Um, oftentimes you're kind of you'll notice when you rinse your grains, the water might get a little cloudy. It's removing that dust and act and excess starch. Um, you want to use something that's like a fine mesh sieve, for example, like this, because if you have tiny quinoa, you don't want it to fall through the cracks. So I usually measure it out dump it in this guy and rinse it. I try to use like the most powerful function of my sink because if it's too, I think if it's too weak of a stream, it kind of tends to bubble out of the sieve. So I try to, you know, get the, the pressure wash function out. I'm just going to check the chat here. Um, Heather asked, what temp am I baking at? I am baking, baking at 400 degrees. And thank you 2C for chiming in on that. All right, and I will go ahead and show you my grains here just for reference. So my quinoa looks like it's pretty much absorbed all the liquid. Make sure my phone isn't getting a facial. There we go. We'll give it a little stir. Yes, yeah, so most of the water is absorbed. So when it comes to cooking grains like quinoa, I went ahead and I added the water and the, um, the quinoa to the pan. And I brought it to a boil. And then after it boiled, I went ahead and brought it down to a simmer until all the water is absorbed. Since all the water is pretty much absorbed, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on to low. And then I'll probably turn it off here in a minute or so. Because this is a longer portion of the recipe and I wanted to keep class moving, I went ahead and just started it before class and I didn't toast it or do anything special. I'm actually going to spotlight myself for this. Here we go. So I didn't do anything special pre-cooking the grains, but one of the things you can do to your grains to really add more technique from your cooking or to achieve better texture or flavor is toasting, which is very optional. So if you're going to toast your grains and it's a grain that you have to um, rinse off, I recommend getting a pan, toasting those grains in oil, and then after they're toasted, after about three to five minutes, you'll notice they'll get a little brown, they'll smell a little nutty, you'll then want to rinse them. You don't want to rinse them before you toast them because them being really wet won't allow them to actually toast. I love toasting grains like farro um, and sometimes I do rice. It just depends if I have that capacity. You can also buy some grains that don't need to be rinsed, so they might be easier to toast. It's just a really nice way to add more complexity to the flavor and to the recipe overall. It's a really good technique to add if you feel like your grains are very bland or boring. You don't need to add any extra salt or sugar or fat to get that nice flavor. Um, you also wanna simmer your grains and you wanna bring the liquid to a boil, but then you wanna simmer them and that means to reduce the heat down and cover it because we want those grains to really absorb all that liquid to make them tender. I have found that some people prefer rice to be a little harder than others. So it's kind of like pasta cooking where you can taste it until it's your al dente. So there's nothing wrong with if you like your grains a little undercooked or overcooked. Um, but I want to just remind you that every grain has a different cooking time. So just refer to the back of the package as well. Let's check the chat here. Are there other ways to cook the squash? It's too hot to put in my oven. That's a really great question. It's hot outside. If we don't have AC or even if we do have AC, turning on the oven cranks up the temperature of the room. Wonderful question. If you have a stove top, you could totally um, dice it the same way and put it on the stove top with, um, with a pan with some oil and lightly saute it. You could, if you have a grill outside, you could cut it into longer slivers. And when you have a zucchini squash like this, you would want to cut it long ways or wide and not dice it um, because it'll fall through the grates of your grill. Or if you want to do your grill, you could dice it and put it in some foil. I always default to grill cooking when it's super hot out. You could, and I'm not super familiar with it because I haven't done it, but I feel like you could probably dice your zucchini very fine. You could probably add it into a salad 
with some oil and vinegar and let that acid really soften the zucchini because it's not a necessarily hard vegetable, but those are some ways that you could go about cooking it without actually having to turn your oven on. An air fryer as well. Yes, I forget about those. They are just like tiny ovens in my brain. So yes, an air fryer would be a perfect way. It controls that heat. So yes, awesome. Thank you, Tusi. Okay, so let's go back to our knife safety and our knife demo. I have this long zucchini here and you saw me in the beginning of class really roll through my dicing. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about knife safety. I think it's a good reminder I myself needed some practice over and over again before I felt more confident with a knife in the kitchen. Um, I'm just moving the tripod, there we go. So let's just start out by general knife safety without actually using our zucchini. So one of the first things I wanna point out is when you hold a knife, you don't wanna hold it like this. You don't wanna hold it like this. You wanna pinch it, pinch the blade and roll your fingers back. That's really good control. You have control of the blade while also hold, giving a firm grasp on the handle. The reason we don't want our finger up here, which is a default method a lot of folks do, it's okay, is that we don't have good grip of this blade, right? If I try to cut down on something that's a little uneven, it might wobble side to side. If I pinch and I curl, I have really good grip and control over my knife. I'm not going to be cutting at a weird angle and it'll slip out from under me. I also want to talk a little bit about how your hand looks when you cut. So oftentimes I've seen people go up and down. We actually want to go tip to back, tip to back. Now there are times where we go up and down. Say I'm mincing my dill, I go up and down, up and down. Totally fine. But when it comes to actually slicing something, we want to go tip to back. So let's go ahead and start that. Tip to back, tip to back. When you're cutting a vegetable as well, you want to kind of think of these three things, slabs, sticks, and cubes. So we want to create a slab. So that way our round circular vegetable isn't sliding all over the cutting board. So these are our slabs. I'm checking the chat here. Yes, Christina, we will get a replay of this. I am recording this class. So at the very end of class, um, I will send this to the WellSense team and this will be available on their Facebook page. I believe other folks have seen the recording so they might have more to add in the chat. But yes, we will have this available for you. So then we're gonna do our slabs or we're gonna do our sticks, I'm sorry. We have our slabs. So I'm cutting them into even smaller stab, slabs and we'll do our sticks. All right. Sticks, tip to back. And sometimes the zucchini is uneven, for example, in the middle, so I'll cut it again. So nice, now we have these nice sticks. I like to take it easy with zucchini because this is a odd vegetable to cut. Now we have these sticks. So we had our slabs, our sticks, now we're gonna cube it. You do not have to do this many at once. I'm gonna take this moment here to recognize my guide hand. So my guide hand, you'll notice, I tend to keep my fingers curled. I don't keep my fingers out and pointing. I either keep them curled under like this or like this. I do that because when I'm cutting, I'm not gonna hit the tips of my fingers if I keep my knuckle out to protect them. There are times where my fingers don't necessarily do that, but it depends if I'm cutting a wonky vegetable. So now we have our cubes. You don't have to cube your vegetables. We could try some other cuts from our slabs. We're grilling, maybe we wanted to do some half moons. Maybe we wanted to keep this whole thing together and do bigger circles. Do some half moons. We could even, and I've tried this before, this is kind of tricky because it's very thin here and very thick up here, but let's try it. We could even do something similar. To this. Where I say this is kind of like, like a zucchini steak where it's like flattened. This would be really nice to grill because they're not gonna necessarily fall through your grate. Or you could have your 
your dice or you could have your half moons. I love a quick dice. I think it's the quickest cooking. I think it's the easiest and it doesn't necessarily matter as much if this piece is bigger than this piece when it cooks because usually when I dice things like this, I, they're either in the oven so they're getting heat from all over or they're in a foil packet on the grill. Um, we have a question, Paige, what are some good quality knife brands you like to use? That's a great, great question. I am new to the culinary world. And when I say new, I mean, I didn't go to culinary school or I don't have, you know, a strong, strong, strong culinary background other than being a self-taught cook who just loves to read and be educated. So it took a while for me to understand that quality knives are very expensive. Like I'm talking a hundred dollars a knife. I don't know about you, but I don't have $100 to be spending on a knife. I, however, for Christmas, got this knife. I think it was about 40 bucks. Um, I cannot pronounce that brand, but I think this has been a great knife. I think it was definitely worth um, the $45. I think that other knives I've had have rusted um, because sometimes I think my water is super hard or soft or however that works. It's just the knives aren't necessarily great quality. But I think a chef's knife, a good quality chef's knife, stainless steel, is the perfect addition to your kitchen. A paring knife and a chef's knife. I think you can accomplish very many cuts and very many tasks with those two knives. This is a chef's knife. You don't need anything too terribly large. I believe this is eight inches. Because if you're getting something huge, but you're not, you know, you're not used to controlling your blade so closely, you might have a hard time with too much of a knife. But this was a great brand on Amazon. I also recommend reading the reviews and finding what works for you and your budget, but that's that's usually my default is I'm sure there's a perfect brand out there that's probably way above my budget that maybe one day I could splurge on, but um, kind of checking those things out might help you build your your own knife set. Yes, you're welcome, Annie. I'm sorry I didn't have any specific brands in mind other than this one. I mean, I got this one for Christmas. This is my only nice, I'd say expensive knife. Everything else is like cuisine art from Target and they are pretty, they're getting kind of rusty. They're holding on by a thread. All right, let's check out our rice or I'm sorry, my quinoa, it's looking beautiful. So I'm gonna take this off the heat. <laughs> Has anyone, and I'm just curious because I'm one of those people that gets really tired of breakfast food. So I like to look on Pinterest and explore. Has anyone ever had quinoa for breakfast, whether it's savory or sweet? I've seen quinoa and like breakfast foods as if you're having it for oatmeal. And then I've also seen it for like the base of an egg bowl. I'm just curious. I was very surprised and intrigued by it. And I'm curious if anybody else had any feedback. Some folks are saying no. Oh, Deborah eats it plain for breakfast. Hey, that would be good. I was just curious. I don't know why I never thought of it because it's a whole grain like oatmeal. I have to experiment more with quinoa for sweet dishes. I think it could be a really nice addition to something sweet. Oh, we have someone who says yes many times. Okay, so then maybe it was just me who was really surprised. Okay. So it seems like breakfast food is the choice over quinoa regardless. So I appreciate that. I'm gonna give this a nice little fluff. Fluffing them with a fork just kind of helps separate them before serving. But we have some time. We still have our, our main components of our meal cooking. But you know what? I am all about adding flavor without necessarily leaning so much on salt. So what I think is that we should take this time to add a little bit of extra flavor to our quinoa. So first and foremost, I'm going to add a little bit of oil to kind of help not stick to each other. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt, some cracked pepper,
And honestly, I have this other half of this lemon. I'm going to add it to my quinoa because we're making a quinoa salad. If you loved a certain herb or spice, garlic powder, Italian seasoning, little red pepper flakes, add it whatever you want to really spice this up. I'm just going to juice it over my hand so I can catch the seeds. Oh, I heard a seed fly in. I'm going to get that out. Okay. Beautiful. Well, we have some more information in the chat. We have a comment from our regular 2C. She says, she's never heard of breakfast quinoa. It sounds like the perfect breakfast dish to teach. Yes, I agree. I definitely think that this is a trend that I'm going to have to investigate and incorporate into class. Maybe a savory and a sweet option. Ooh, someone, oh, Marianne says, there is a restaurant that puts quinoa in their hash with shredded potatoes. That would be really yummy. I think that would add some good nutrition and give it a different texture. I really like that. Estella says she puts butter, salted or unsalted, in her quinoa. That would be a perfect thing to add. Give it a little flavor. I think fat really adds a depth of flavor as well. I know sometimes, um, especially as dietitians, we try to encourage folks to moderate or in moderation consume things like butter, but... I'm not going to sit here and eat this whole thing. So if I had two tablespoons of butter in the grand scheme of things, am I eating two tablespoons of butter at this sitting? No. So if you want to add a little bit to flavor it, you definitely can. Now, if I added a whole stick of butter to this, that might be a little much. If you are someone who leans heavily on butter, you could try to cut it half and half. So still get that butter flavor by adding, you know, the two tablespoons, but then do the rest and a heart healthy oil like avocado or olive or canola or something like that. All right, let me just check my recipe here. Okay, I'm going to just take a peek at our fish and see how it's looking. A good way to see if fish is cooked, um, usually for chicken or poultry or beef, I use a meat thermometer, but for fish, you can tell if it's if it went from that like lighter translucent pink to a more firmer pink and you can kind of flake it away as well just to test and if the if the inside still has that raw look to it you know it's not done yet I'm going to steal this fork All right. I'd say about five more minutes and then we are all set. Let me just clean up my workstation here. All right, while we finish waiting for our fish and our zucchini to cook, does anyone have any questions or any comments about the recipe so far? Oh, I see some messages. Tusi says, if you want to avoid butter, you can cook it in broth or flavor your water with your fave seasonings. Exactly. You already know, Tusi. And I love cooking with bone broth with my grains just to give it a little extra protein boost and some good flavor. Uh, Deborah's going to a party this weekend and she's going to have to bring some of uh, or make some of the dishes that we have learned to bring. I love that. That's awesome. Awesome, awesome. And checking, no other questions here. All right, anybody have any thoughts, any feelings, concerns about the recipe so far? This is something I would definitely try. Yay, good. I sometimes think the most simple recipes, you just need like a reminder that these things exist and that it just takes a quick second to throw together. I have a question. Do you think the salmon will be equally good cold? That's a really great question. So me personally, I know this about myself. I do not like cold salmon or reheated salmon, but that doesn't mean it's not good. 
I think I just in general need salmon to be really seasoned because it's not my favorite fish. But I think if you're someone who enjoys salmon, I don't think it would be bad cold, especially with like how heavy we season it or how heavy I seasoned it with the dill. Um, but I don't think it wouldn't hurt to try. Definitely try it. I'm going to go ahead and grab a bowl out. Let's put this up away. Preparing for our final product. So because I have a lot of quinoa, I made a lot of quinoa because when I cook things, I like to cook in batches. I like to prepare ahead. So tomorrow, if you know I don't want to make a grain for lunch or dinner, I have them already pre-cooked. I'm going to add just a little bit of quinoa to make my salad for my food right now. So whenever my food is done in the oven, we are going to add the zucchini to our quinoa and mix. I'm gonna package up the rest of my quinoa and save it for another meal. Or I might experiment with some breakfast recipes. I always spend extra money at the store to buy those little packages of cooked brown rice or quinoa that are like two or $3 a pop, but you can microwave them because sometimes I just don't have the time or the energy to make greens from scratch. So I remind myself when I am cooking quinoa or farro or a green that takes more than 15 minutes to cook, to batch cook it. So now I have no excuses to have to spend that extra money at the store for that convenience because I already did it. All right. Let's just take a taste of our quinoa. Delicious. Check in the chat here. Juicy started cooking more farro since we cook it in class. Awesome. I started cooking it a lot more too, especially outside of class because I forget all the wonderful ways you can enjoy it. Farro is probably my favorite grain because it's thicker and nuttier. Susan has made a gazpacho soup the other day that an old friend reminded her of. It's super healthy and if you love tomatoes, it's for you. No grain, but might taste amazing with some added. That sounds really good. I wonder, is that like a a family or a personal recipe or did you just find one and you make it? That sounds really yummy. I love a good soup, especially since the summer is dwindling down and it's becoming fall. And in my mind, that's soup season. I am going to grab the salmon out of the oven now. I'll give you all a quick view. So you can even see here that our zucchini browned really nicely, not too crazy, um, but we do have some good color here, cooked rather well, and our salmon cooked through. I did go ahead and split it in half. Um, sometimes I can never tell with salmon, especially depending how hot my house is or how hot it is outside. I'm gonna go ahead and add my zucchini to my quinoa. Oh. And I know this recipe took a little bit longer because I talk, but honestly, we're like rolling through this guy. I'm all about simple, quick, and easy for a weeknight dinner. I wanna have my nutritious, healthy dinner so I can have my chocolate dessert. I need to get my good nutrition in so I can have my sweet treat. And I customize it the way that I like so that I really enjoy it. Now, this doesn't have a lot of extra things in it, but you could add some nuts or seeds to give it a nice crunch. You could also add other roasted vegetables as well. I love roasted broccoli. I think it's phenomenal. You could add some roasted 
um, greens, whether you want to do some kale or I cooked with escarole today. All right. A beautiful little salad here. My salmon looks a little sad because I cut it in half. What's escarole? It is like a peppery green. Let me show you a picture. I'll share my screen. I was going to ask the same. So it's a green, a leafy green from the chicory family and has a bitter flavor with really curly leaves. If you see it at the grocery store, I think it looks like curly hair. Oh, I totally, somebody gave me that. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was just like some type of lettuce or something. It's essentially a type of lettuce. It's a leafy green. Um, mm -hmm. I, I uh, sauteed it and made a pasta with like beans and tomatoes. It was really yummy. Um, I have never picked it up from the store before until I taught this class today. And it was pretty good. It's not as tough as kale, but it's not as soft as spinach, if that makes sense. But it comes from, it's similar to the endive. So yeah, lots of adaptability. I'm all about taking a recipe that, you know, say you don't have all the ingredients for, but you still wanna make it. For example, if you didn't have zucchini, add another vegetable. Uh, I think this is perfect for this time of year though, because there's so many zucchinis that are ripe. <laughs> so why not? That's why it's a perfect summer salad. But I don't know about you, but I think this looks beautiful. We got our nice dill here. All right, now we need to do our taste test. I always like to flake my salmon because I need a bite with everything. Oops, there we go. Okay, we got a full bite. Perfect. Honestly, I think it could use some more black pepper, but I love black pepper. That's my preferred spice. Really nicely cooked salmon. Really simple. I think the simplicity of this recipe allows each ingredient to really shine, like the quinoa and the roasted zucchini. And just some fresh dill on some salmon with some lemon. Um, super simple. It's 6.40 now. Probably took me no more than 30 minutes. My cleanup is really minimal. I made some extra dirty plates for the sake of my demo, but we really just have a sheet pan and a pot and then my own plate here. So dinner on the table in 30 minutes. I don't know about you, but I really like that. So yeah, anybody have any questions? I can ask for another round of questions. And then if there are no more, I will go ahead and end the recording. All right, well, I will go ahead and end the recording in case any folks have any questions off camera. Um, thank you all so, for much, so much for joining and join us next time.